Um, hey everyone, uh, greetings. This is my uh, Twitch show level with me where I play through games and talk about what I think is going on in the level design with them. And this is the beginner's guide. This is a walking simulator kind of game made out. Um, it came out in 2015. It runs on Source Engine 1. And um, I thought this would, might be like a nice game to play after all the violence and brutality of Bioshock for the past two or three months. So uh, let's start. Um, as I play, uh, you'll note that I've actually uh, deleted the narration from this game. Uh, this game normally has a very, very lovely script and voiceover uh, performed by David Reedon. Uh, who explains a lot of what's going on, but I deleted it so that I don't have to compete with him. I'll try to channel my inner Davy Reedon, I guess. Um, so this is how uh, Beginner's Guide starts. Starts with a white screen where uh, he's laying out the stakes, where he's saying that this is a story about um, a level designer named Coda who was making levels in Source Engine 1 from 2008 to 2011. So this is kind of the, of like a meta narrative, meta level design about level design, kind of. Um, so, you know, you can read the subtitles above uh, to kind of get a sense of what's going on. So just... First, on the outset here, this is a really, really interesting choice. Uh, this is clearly an inspiration from DE Dust. Pretty much every Counter-Strike player or gamer will probably recognize this kind of aesthetic and level. Um, even though it's technically not really DE Dust, right? DE Dust doesn't really have these kinds of uh, canopies or anything. DE Dust uh, looks, the, the texture is a little bit different, but it's also been kind of like painstakingly replicated, right? This is clearly some kind of photo source from like cgtextures.com or myyang.com uh, that was manipulated to look kind of like DE Dust. Even the texture ratio, uh, the, the texture dimension of the DE Dust wall, the tiling pattern is like the same kind of, which is really clever. Uh, Normally when you're doing wall textures, uh, especially in this old kind of engine, you do like a square texture like for like 128 by 128 or 256 by 256. But you'll notice with this wall texture here, it's actually kind of more this vertical kind of thing. It's more like a maybe 256 by 512 kind of texture and it's stretched out a lot to look kind of ugly. And um... This level, I think, is about kind of about setting um, setting the mood and tone um, where you are kind of just exploring this environment and there's no gameplay. And um, I think this is a very intentional move where we associate Counter-Strike with something where there's just so much gameplay, so much stuff going on uh, to the point where even if it's like a competitive uh, mode, you know, like the textures don't even matter that much. So it's also just interesting the way they've designed this. Like whoever built this really knows what a first level made in Counter Strike looks like. Uh, I personally started making my levels in Counter Strike. That's how I got into level design. So it really just like. Brings, brings me back a little bit, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, so, uh, you might know some text in the upper left corner. That's because I have developer mode on. Uh, so that I can, like, activate cheats and show you stuff. Uh, sometimes. Um, and what we're doing right now is... This is like a sci-fi kind of Half-Life 1 thing where the architecture kind of looks like kind of chunky kind of like again something characteristic of what you might have seen in back in the like Half-Life 1 kind of days uh, or very early maybe source mapping days and let's see oh we have a gun oh my god Oh my god, the gun shoots and stuff. Oh my god. 
Nice particle effects. Oh no, I ran out of bullets. And I can't reload, oh gosh. I never noticed that. Huh, interesting. <laughs> but anyway, let's keep going. <clears throat> if we walk this way, there's these weird chunks. Um, this is pretty popular. This was kind of popular back in the day where uh, you wouldn't really have modeled out chunks. Like if you wanted to make like an organic like rock, you would have to actually clip that using the low poly level design tools. And it was pretty inefficient to clip these rocks. So like people would kind of be competing to be like, look at the best rock that I made. Uh, if you, this is still a kind of contest uh, that still happens in 3D game art, where if you go to like a website like Polycount, uh, you go to the forums, there's like a, thread where you can see everyone showing off their rocks that they've sculpted. It's like a very traditional kind of environment art thing you're doing. It is kind of weird that that rock is spinning though. That's kind of weird. And it's weird that we can hear the sound of fire, but then there's no visible fire, right? So clearly we can interpret this as the level designer did not have time to implement some kind of fire effect or something. What else is going on here? One detail I really like is this, you'll, if you look at this gun model, this gun model is like really smart. <laughs> like, like this gun model looks like a weird MP5 or something that doesn't quite make sense, but it's like a weird futuristic chunky low poly MP5 view model. Very characteristic of a typical mod of this kind of era. I think the one thing that does feel a little bit off about this level though, uh, well, first of all, God, I love this texture lighting. Um, so this is a feature built into like Quake and Source Engines where you have a, you can have textures emit light, which is a really, really great tool. But the way that actually works is <clears throat> internally the uh, the light rendering calculation light baking thing just spawns a bunch of little light sources there so you can actually see the actual light sources that come from the texture lighting and it looks kind of chunky like this uh, but I would say the one thing that does feel a little bit anachronistic not quite right is all the signage um, someone I think an amateur level designer who was mapping in this era would not have put four signs here. They would have put one sign here and then kind of left it at that. They would not have thought to repeat that sign. <laughs> like when you look at it now, you think, okay, well, this is kind of sloppy, but it's kind of sloppy in the wrong way, I would argue. A lot of this architecture also resembles what we might call the gray box in level design. Uh, if you go on Twitter and search for Blocktober, you'll see a lot of blockouts. Uh, the blockout represents the first initial part of a level when you're building it out, and it's usually untextured and very spartan. And here you can see that it's just very, yeah, like unadorned, literal like concrete, even though we're supposed to be in like a spaceship or something, that's kind of weird. But very <clears throat> just kind of spartan levels, not much set dressing or anything. Certainly not what you'd expect from like a 2008 era FPS. Let's keep Security going here. Again, just look at how chunky that light map is. Oh my god. <laughs> Oof. <clears throat> Well, this is going on. I love, so I really also kind of love this room. Uh, let me turn on the wireframe for you real quick so you can see it better. This room is just like a big, wide expanse. And wait, what the heck? Enemy force Everything is visible. Oh, that's because it's built in a giant room. Oh my God. Okay, I'll get to that later. Um, but what was I saying? Oh, right. So the thing I really like about this room is it's like a big wide room and 
It's just this weird empty. It's like weirdly empty in a way that you wouldn't see in most kinds of games. Like I can walk over here and it's just this weird empty thing. And then there's this weird glass wall. Like why is that here? A lot of it just feels awkward. Part of what makes it awkward is that this is like set in the future. And with the future, we expect uh, the level designer to clearly define like the task of each room, the intended task or function of each room. And here, this is just like a functionless, weird gray box room that hasn't been finished yet. So that's what makes it feel like delightfully awkward in a way that's very, again, resonant of amateur level designers learning how to build their first level in like 2008. Let's keep going. Oh man, look at that skybox too. And then you can actually see the skybox boundary at the bottom. First of all, it's really... Okay, so this skybox is also really brilliant in a way where um, it's just really noisy, really dense in a way that you would not want a skybox like this. Uh, it's just way too high resolution, too much noise, not enough medium and low frequency kind of stuff going on. Uh, if you ever see like a space skybox in a game, it won't just be millions of stars everywhere. It's going to be like a nice nebula in the middle to help define the horizon. Uh, look at like, for example, home skyboxes in the game Homeworld uh, are probably one of the like best space skyboxes ever made. And in that one, they're not even textures. Actually, I believe that was all done with vertex colors. Uh, look that up. It's really fascinating. But my point is that this is just a really poor choice of skybox. But again, in a way that actually fits with a lot of the tone. Um, and I think the narrator maybe does explain the skybox stuff. I don't know. I haven't been looking at the narration. Uh, but if you watch the subtitles at the top, that, that should be what the narrator is actually saying. Uh, what else should I be doing here? here? Oh, there's these three dots. I wonder what these dots are. Maybe we'll learn about it later. Okay, let's keep going. And now we're stuck in this weird corridor where it's like a maze. It's like a concrete space station. Oh no, he skipped me past it. I'm going to go back. Uh, let's get a good look of the actual labyrinth. labyrinth. So we started here and then we ended up here. And then that's the actual whole labyrinth map in case you're familiar with it. Um, let's see what else is going on here. Yeah, it's a pretty twisty labyrinth. So the labyrinth is also kind of this motif that keeps popping up in this game if you like play it for real. But what's really interesting about this labyrinth is it kind of does mimic the mindset of typical kinds of um, level designers from this era where, or, or, or an amateur level designer especially, where you're building this thing out and you're not really thinking about how a player will actually experience it. So you end up designing this level that's like the best level ever, super big, super complicated. And then if you actually watch someone play it, you realize what a huge, overcomplicated mess you've designed. Uh, so I think that's super interesting. Um, how the labyrinth kind of represents this kind of amateurness on the part of what how like a level designer imagines the player in interiority and stuff but i think what else is happening here is that the labyrinth also becomes again like a metaphor that we'll see later in the game anyway that's the whole labyrinth design um and before we go to the end i just want to fly around here so you can see the whole thing uh, when we start in that room, we start in that room actually in a white room. Very common to do that, uh, where 
uh, screen fading and screen overlays are actually kind of hard to do a little bit in Source Engine. So it's actually a little bit easier to just, instead of telling this game to like fade the screen to like a white background, it's easier to just literally put the player in a white or black room. And that's a kind of a trick that dates back to like Quake days. So that's actually a little bit smart. That almost kind of marks this as not an amateur kind of game. Yeah, you have ENV fade. That's true. That does fade the screen. But if you want like a long sustained fade, and if you want to be able to change the length of that fade dynamically, it's much easier to have the player just be in this room and then teleport them out whenever you need to. So you don't really need... So the fade there is actually kind of inflexible. You wouldn't actually want to use ENV underscore fade here. Sorry, people in the chat were asking if that's really hard. Uh, what else is going on here? Uh, sorry, sorry if the motion blur is making you sick. Sorry. Um, oh, right. So uh, one other thing is you'll notice that we can see the entire level. And this is kind of unusual. Uh, if you were watching the Bioshock stream from last time, I'll even turn on the wireframe to help you see it. Even when we're inside the level, you can see the entire level. Uh, this is very unusual in Half-Life 1, Half-Life 2 era mapping because usually we do a lot of occlusion calling and separate everything into leaves. Uh, using a technology called BSP, binary space partitioning, that chops, chops up the level into chunks that you can't see the whole level at once. You'll notice you can see the whole level right here because viz blocking and occlusion is not working. And that's because uh, you'll see in the ending that the whole place is literally surrounded with a giant room. And Part of that is the, the narrative kind of spins that as like a beautiful metaphor for what a skybox actually is and uh, what uh, video game interiority and level design actually is. Even when you're outside, you're actually inside and so on. But from a level design craft perspective, that's also kind of this brilliant move because that's actually what you would do if you were a beginning level designer who didn't know how to solve leaks. The easiest way to solve a leak is to surround your entire level with a giant box. And if you do that, that's so bad per for performance, that's so bad in terms of craft, but doggone it, if you're a amateur level designer, you just wanna share your level with your friends. You don't wanna deal with professionalism or what good practice is. You just wanna get on with it. Anyway, uh, oh, let me bind my cheats. Like this can go a little fa bit faster. Uh, anyway, pretend we went through that maze as intended, and we kept going. Now suddenly, this room, we're, we're paused in here. We have to listen to Davy's narration. Oh no, I didn't delete this sound. Oops. So now we have to sacrifice ourselves by stepping into that beam. And um, I think that's an interesting move here. I think it's not really, it's kind of a little bit too high concept for one amateur mapper would do. But this is also kind of Davy's point that this is an interesting thing. Usually in these kinds of games, you'd be like shooting a bunch of soldiers or something. So here, instead, we have to kill ourselves. So let's go and do that, I guess. And then sure enough, you die, except we technically actually haven't died. Uh, it's just triggered a camera and horizontally oriented it. And within the engine, we actually haven't died. Because if we died, it would have to, like, reload the level or something, right? So we jump into that beam, and this is what literally happens in the game. 
Um, you step into the beam, and then the beam raises you up, and you see everything. So, technically, this is why the entire map had to be in one giant room, but that also, in kind of this really genius way, fits with what an amateur level designer would have done, which is to surround the entire level with a giant room. That also kind of explains why the whole thing is kind of low poly, because it's drawing the entire level at once as well. So from like an artistic, conceptual, historical, technical perspective, like this level just, I think, hits a lot of really nice notes here. Um, in the chat, people are asking, uh, can you think of an actual bug someone might have caused to make the player actually start floating? And I literally can't. I don't think... I can't think of a bug that would have done that, honestly. Uh, that's such a specific behavior. I can think of a bug where maybe if you died, you would be snapped like on top of a surface or something, but I can't think of a bug where you'd be constantly rising at a constant rate. So that's what's kind of interesting about this, is that um, the game is also kind of lying to you a little bit. It's kind of pretending that it's exposing this technical materiality of what it's like to work in a game engine with level design. And a lot of the time, it actually rings true in a really nice, powerful way. But some of the time, it tells really pointed lies for really powerful narrative, specific kind of narrative effect. Um, I'm not upset that the game lies to players. I think it's fine. I think that's part of what the game is. Anyway, um, the beam would not push you. I don't think in that... I don't think in Half-Life 1, a beam by itself would trigger that. You'd have to actually have a trigger push volume there. <laughs> and even if you did have a trigger push, as soon as you leave that trigger push volume, you would stop moving too. And also trigger push would apply momentum. It wouldn't do a constant smooth floating. Anyway, um, in this new section, now we can only walk backwards. So I can, I'm pressing W, and pressing W is not working. So I'm, I have to walk backwards. Uh, what's really interesting here, I mean, personally, I've, I literally, in like 2011, I prototyped a source mod where you could only walk backwards. Uh, I never released it and I never showed it to anyone, um, which is what's a little bit interesting and creepy about it. Um, I actually write a blog post about how I'm partly the inspiration behind Coda, maybe, probably. Um, I've never really bothered talking to Davey about it, but um, I'm part. I'm I'm one of the experimental source modders that's working in that era of 2008 to 2011. So that's what's kind of weird about this. Like, I'm literally playing a prototype that I didn't make, but I did make. Anyway, let's keep going. I like this level design here. I really like how there's just a point light in the middle. And I also like the use of brick here. Uh, if you look up like a Valve, like if you look up, I'll go to the Valve developer wiki and you look up how to make a source level, the tutorial rooms look pretty much like this. Uh, the the, the default texture that gets selected when you open up the Half-Life 2 level editor is a brick texture because brick starts with the letter B. So it, it kind of goes in alphabetical order from there. So it, it's a brick floor texture, actually. I, so I almost wish this was a brick floor texture. That would have been more authentic. Uh, but here, the idea that's a brick concrete room with just these point lights sitting in the middle, like that's a really... Again, this is a level that a lot of people have made. This is very like representative of the amateur level designer experience. Anyway, I'll keep walking here. Wait, 
When she stops and looks, it becomes clearer. And now we're entering this big gray box territory here. Notice how the light maps aren't so chunky. The light maps are actually pretty sharp and nice. That's because the light mapping in that previous chapter was purposely really low resolution to evoke Half-Life 1. But I really like the architecture going on here. This is a trick that I think uh, AAA and a lot of kind of first person designers, especially working in realism, are kind of glomming onto. Uh, for a long time, there was a really strong trend, especially if you were like a European mapper coming from the Counter Strike community, especially in like Germany or something, where there was a like, huge reliance on photo source and all your textures, you'd always want to be as like dirty and grungy as possible because that's what would be like realistic. But then here you see it's very plain and uh, that, that, that kind of comes from, I would say, Mirror's Edge maybe in 2008 where suddenly there becomes this big trend for, of cleanliness and smoothness in level design punctuated by small moments of dirty details and grunge and stuff. Overwatch does this really well. If you play an Overwatch level, the textures are pretty much like flat colors, except for some like grunge decals or some really subtle edge wear, like a really subtle roughness map on it. So here we kind of, we're also tracing in this era, 2009 to 2011. This is also when cleanliness starts becoming more of a design trend and minimalism and, and all that kind of stuff starts happening in levels. Uh, yes, Half-Life 2 was oppressively filthy, yes. Um, oh, why can't I turn around? Oh no! I forgot about that part. That's really clever. <laughs> you keep trying to turn around, but you can't really turn around. Yes, Europe is filth. That's, that's what I meant. Oh, what are we doing here? Okay. Uh, if you're having troubles buffering, um, sorry, uh, I will be... All my monitors look green here, and I'm doing 4,000 bitrate pretty consistently. If you're having trouble watching it, uh, I'd recommend either watch it after on the archive, or uh, I usually upload these videos to YouTube afterwards as well. Anyway, let's keep going. 30 minutes, and I've barely finish this first chapter. Okay, let's keep going. This is a really interesting effect where there's, uh, to get the darkness here, the fog is super, super sharp. And this is a really interesting use, conceptual use of fog because no video game would ever want to do this with fog. Ever since the notorious Superman 64 incident where the fog was so sharp, every game has tried its darndest not to show that it's using fog. You are now entering... Oh, I like this sign. This is an interesting sign here because uh, you can see it's like tiling on the back in a really purposeful way. Like that's just so... And it's misaligned too? Oh my god. Look, you can see the texture seam right there. Oh my god. Let's keep going. Is this a Slenderman reference? People are asking in the chat. I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, yeah, that's right. In the chat, people are mentioning uh, Silent Hill as well. Silent Hill was a very good fog game as well. That should be a new genre people make, right? Like fog games? Let's see, what's going on here? So we have big towers again. Notice this gray aesthetic in like a very default looking skybox here. This skybox reminds me of, I, I'm, I'm working Unity a lot these days. So this reminds me of like the default Unity skybox a lot.
Oh, it's interesting how, um... I like how the player spawned away from the stairwell. I think the instinct here would have been to put the player kind of closer to the stairwell, or maybe have the player start here, so that the player knows they're supposed to walk up the stairs. So it's very interesting to have the player start off to the side instead, and walk for like a solid 20 seconds, pretty slowly, up to the stairwell. And now it takes a while to climb the stairs too. But again, notice the default skybox aesthetic, the gray box aesthetic. Oh man, and now the walk speed is slowing down as I approach the top. Half-Life 2 actually makes this pretty easy. There was a uh, ENV underscore player speed mod. I mean, no, it was maybe player underscore speed mod. Point player speed mod? I forget what it was called, but uh, that's actually like a built-in entity because Half-Life 2 actually does kind of these slow motion sequences sometimes too. Now I'm at the top of the stairs. Nice sense of scale, too. And then you walk in here, and you see all this text. Using this point text is interesting from a source level designer perspective, because uh, this is technically using an entity, I think called point message, and point message technically isn't meant to be visible inside the game. You'll notice if you played Half-Life 2 or something, you never saw in-world text just floating in there like that. It's, it's usually meant more as a developer note, like a comment you're putting in the game to like remind yourself, like placeholder, in the future the door will open and explode, or something like that. So, interesting choice here to use this kind of developer sense of text. And those were all ideas of games that the uh, creator of this level, Coda, was putting in the level. Anyway, now we're here. God, look at that texture seam. Oh my god, that texture seam is just... That's like... Genius. I think. Oh my god. Like, that that's making me cry. That's just beautiful. Oh, really interesting textures here. These textures are kind of reminding me of... There was a mod that before Team Fortress 2 came out, there was a mod called Fortress Forever. This is really reminding me of the Fortress Forever aesthetic, where it's uh, very clean, concrete forms everywhere, and... Uh, built-in, like, embedded lighting like that. Uh, there's a question in the chat. In my, in your experience designing levels, would you ever have made a level without a gameplay purpose in mind beforehand? Uh, tons of times. There's, uh, you know, often you'll gray box, and especially if you're making, like, a Counter-Strike level, but sometimes there's also contests where you kind of just try to detail the level as much as possible. Because in 2008, this is also kind of straddling this era where level designers are still kind of partly environment artists. Nowadays, a level designer is definitely not an environment artist. But back then, it was very common to kind of design things where you don't really care about the gameplay, where you just want to make like an interesting looking space. But these days, level design tools are just so different that it's actually kind of hard to do that. That's why walking simulators have kind of had this golden age, only with the end of this era of the level designer becoming, having to choose between doing gameplay or becoming environment artist and specializing. Anyway, uh, this red stripe, yeah, that, it, it, I feel like I'm in a base. I feel like I'm going to capture the flag base. So again, very, very interesting aesthetic. It's not, it's like part of a multiplayer map. That's just 
randomly here that we're playing for some reason. Now, this is an interesting thing. Here, there's a one-way drop. This is a very common technique in level design, not just in first-person level design, but for example, Mario. I think the first level of Mario has like a stepped uh, kind of stairwell where you have to climb it up and jump off, and then you can't go back the way you came. And uh, this kind of one-way jumping, one-way drop, very common level design when we kind of want to gate the player and force them to confront or solve whatever's going on here. So uh, just now, Davey had told us that we should try to solve this puzzle. And to force us to try to solve this puzzle and to tell us in using level designer language that we have to stay in this area, that the solution is somewhere in this area, there's a one-way drop here. Uh, Jack Monahan calls this a sawtooth, where we drop down the end of this sawtooth and now we're stuck here. Now we have to confront whatever's going on here. Now I believe the solution to this puzzle is to open that door. And then we go in here. Oh, how do we... I don't remember how to get out now. Oh no. Oh, there's, so there's actually... Oh, that's a clever puzzle. So the way that puzzle works is uh, I had to pull a switch, then while the door was still closing, rush in. And then when I came in, there was the door, there was a switch attached to the back of that door. Interesting. I like the, uh, the use of the black particle effect. It's very subtle. You can maybe see it right here. Uh, that's an interesting choice because the room is already black. So the idea of having a black particle effect overlaid on top of an already black room is kind of unusual. It feels very, um, again, conceptual, very, like, readable. Like, this clearly reads, like, some weird, like, abyss-like dimension. It's like an alternate dimension when we enter this weird, like, airlock of a room. Now, that puzzle... I feel like that puzzle is a little bit tricky because I think the Beginner's Guide has this reputation of a really smart literary game. So you might get people who don't normally play games to play this game. And I think a lot of people who don't normally play games might have had trouble with this puzzle. Where they didn't know that they had should rush in through the door necessarily. Anyway, I think that's Coda's stamp. I think that's his name. I think that's what that means. I forget. Anyway, let's keep going. Ba we're back to this blocky texture lighting up here. This is marking this as like a kind of older era level, I guess. The level's also technically kind of low poly, so it is technically evoking this like Half-Life 1 kind of thing. On the chat, people mentioned that if you take too long on that puzzle, uh, Davey will actually tell you the solution via narration. That's good. I wonder how long he waits. I wonder how long the scripting waits. I, I could probably decompile it and check, but maybe for another time. Oh, we're in a room, but now we're trapped here. Huh, interesting. Oh, now I have to press enter to remove the room. Okay. So the narration told me to press enter. Oh, wow. Again, it turned off all the walls. And looked like that. So... Really good sense of craft here, whoever made this. Um, you'll notice the skybox rooms. This could easily seem really busy and really complicated, but instead of literally being complicated, it's evoking the sense of complicatedness by having like all these snaky like corridors in the skybox. But the snaky corridors in the skybox uh, are kind of flat, gradient, foggy, corridors and shapes so we know to distinguish the real level from the rest of the skybox so 
that's pretty. That's a smart choice there to keep the level readable. Uh, how much of that was actual geometry in the skybox? Uh, I would imagine they made one modular prop. They probably exported some blocks out and then duplicated that static prop in the skybox room to create that illusion of complexity. So I, those were actual 3D shapes in the skybox. Oh, and now we're back. Another thing I like about this and what helps make this whole game feel kind of high concept is the use of those these kind of smash cut, jump cut kind of things. In video game love, and especially like AAA level design, we care so much about like continuity. You always want the transition from one area to another area to make a lot of sense. So the idea that we're just being teleported around like collage montage style feels very, very high concept, honestly, something that most commercial games would not really do. So now we're in this big room. Ooh, really subtle. So you'll notice here we actually start on a slope right here. There's that technically a slope. That's pretty interesting. I think the slope helps us uh, focus on that focal point in the middle. The slope also kind of helps this feel like a vista, like we're standing on top of a cliff and seeing where we're supposed to go. And then there's also this kind of like downwards path here. So that's really smart. And it's a really subtle gradient too, so you don't even really notice it. This is why Koda's games are set in large, flat, empty rooms. This is not a large, flat, empty room. The narrator just lied to us again. Except that's not a lie you were supposed to really catch or analyze. They are later. They are later. He he he's unreliable. If you if you played the game, you would know that he's an unreliable narrator. But that was kind of like a different lie that you weren't supposed to catch. Anyway, I'm turn off wireframes so you can actually see this very handsomely built room here. This house, nice house. So uh, if you play this game for real, uh, Davy in the narration talks about what it was like to build levels briefly in the source engine around here, I believe. And talks about how this is a very typical kind of building that someone might make. But when I look at it, I, I don't know if I agree. This is actually looks very heavily referenced. The idea of having bay windows, the ratio of the windows to the ground floor, all the differentiation and hierarchy going on. This looks clearly inspired by like a real life building. And I think a lot of level designers would not necessarily look to replicate a boring looking restaurant in some random European city. So that's kind of interesting to me where this is supposed to feel very kind of like mundane and stuff and boxy. But this actually feels kind of meticulously modeled in a very specific way, at least to me. It also feels very heavily researched and referenced, again, in a way that I associate personally with the European Counter-Strike 1.6 scene. The Streetwise Fool, that's what this restaurant's called. Interesting. The furniture and stuff is low poly to kind of evoke, I guess, the idea that this is like a low poly environment. But it feels really polished. The idea that you would make a hexagon texture, just specially designed hexagon te texture, just for these tables, feels very polished to me. Nice umbrella. I'm digging the umbrella, though. Oh man, and that carpet. Oh, that carpet. 
I feel like I'm in like Vegas or in like some weird mid love mid tier hotel that's trying to be a bistro or something. I f yeah, I feel like I'm in like an architecture render too. That I think it, it does just feel very heavily referenced to me. Can I go in the handicap room? Cool. Oh, in that toilet. Oh my. Oh my God. You would know. If you know me at all, you know I'm just a total sucker for these toilets. Oh my god. Love this toilet. The beautiful shapes. And then there's like a, a handlebar there because it's a handicapped toilet. Nice, nice uh, different details here. Very thoughtful. Let's see. Anything else to talk about here? Oh man, these down lights. That's super arc viz. That's not that's not normally something I associate with the level design scene. So that's really that's interesting. It's it's interesting how when you like read different lighting schemes, they kind of evoke different eras and evoke different ideas of like schools of thought about what building a 3D environment means. Like you would not waste three spotlights on this wall, I think, if you were a typical level designer. Let's see, what else is going on here? Am I supposed to go in the kitchen? Oh yeah, I'm supposed to go in the kitchen. Okay, let's explore a little bit more before we go back into that kitchen. Can I go in here? Oh, aw, no fun. Oh man, look at this. So whoever made this also made sure the railings fit and the rec then the railings make logical sense. Look at the construction on these stairs. Oh my god, look, the the wood trim actually like conforms to the shape of the wall. Wow. So this is something that a half-life one mapper would not do a half-life one mapper would rather delete this brick pillar than have to actually break up the construction of this stairs so that's really interesting that's something more like a very modern like 2010 or later triple a fps kind of thing hmm interesting Um, oh, people in the chat are asking, what if they just converted an architectural model? Well, we can verify that by turning on the wireframe. Uh, in the wireframe, you'll see that everything is red. Red means that it is a low poly primitive brush that is used as the foundation of all construction in Quake and Source Engine games. So. The idea that they imported this from like Turbo Squid or something is not convincing in terms of this forensics here. It would mean that someone hand built all this. Uh, if it was hand, if it was imported from Turbo Squid, the wireframe would appear blue or teal to indicate that it's a static prop that was imported from like Maya or something. Uh, but anyway, again, really nice construction here, um, but it, it, this feels anachronistic, the way the stairs break up. That's almost something, that's like a detail you might see in The Witness. If you've played The Witness and read the blog post about the level design in The Witness, uh, they talk about how they actually contracted with a architecture studio, and in that architecture studio, they paid a lot of attention to these small construction details like this. That's just a really plausible looking stairwell though. Nicely, nicely done. Okay, anything on this side? I don't know if this opens up to anything. Oh, this is the door we'll see inside the kitchen, but it doesn't open. Okay, I'll just go the way I'm supposed to go. Over here. And now we're entering this weird gray box zone. So this is meant to evoke the idea of building levels in Source Engine. 
Uh, source engine gray boxes were actually called orange maps because that's what Valve used. They used these test textures that were mostly orange and dark gray. I think what's smart about using orange here, and I and I kind of wish the industry went in the way of using orange maps, is that orange is such a strong color that you can't bother lighting it. Like, there's no point in trying to fuss around with a nice lighting scheme because it's orange. It's just going to blow out everything anyway. So you don't have to worry about light temperature, really, because it's so orange. Uh, the orange is also good because it, it clearly marks it as temporary. Uh, I'm teaching a level design class right now, and a lot of my students uh, were doing a lot of gray boxing in Unreal Engine 4. And when they're gray boxing, a lot of them are strongly tempted to work on their lighting because with a gray shape, uh, it catches the lighting in a nice way. So you want to make the lighting look good. But when you're prototyping your game, you should not want to do that. So this also kind of reminds me of like surf maps a little bit. Like the architecture is so weird and strange and abstract. Uh, if you look up a surf map in Counter-Strike, uh, or even uh, maybe the Mirror's Edge time attack levels, they're just these abstract landscapes of shapes. And in a lot of level designers' minds, this is what pure level design looks like. It's not trying to conform to looking like uh, architectural level or something. It's not look, trying to look like a realistic place. It's just trying to look like a bunch of shapes and the shapes provide you with a challenge, with a traversal challenge. And that's supposed to be what pure level design is. So really smart juxtaposition, I think, of putting like a really tightly rendered overproduced architectural visualization of like a weird mediocre bougie cafe with this kind of weird, abstract, totally unlit environment, I think that that was a smart move and helps make the contrast feel really, really strong there. Anyway, we reach the bottom and there's uh, stairs down here. Uh, short disclosure, I actually beta tested this game and I remember I actually got a game-breaking bug here where I jumped down here and there wasn't any collision on this glass tube in the middle so I ended up getting stuck inside this glass tube and that was that felt really bad and terrible one interesting choice with this glass cylinder thing in the middle is that it's not shiny at all it's actually really hard to tell that there's glass here I don't know why you would do that though. It's not really clear to me the purpose of doing that. I would have made the glass really shiny. That's part of the reason why if you play a first person game, the glass is always like guitar solo to death. The glass is always just piercing your eyeballs with its reflections. It's that it reads very clearly as glass and you can see the glass from far away. But here it just looks like some weird slightly darker transparent shade and I can't walk in this volume for some reason. I wonder why you would do that. It's not... To me, I would have just made it look like video game glass. I wouldn't have tried to make it weird or like subtle like this. Um, this is also an interesting kind of shape. This kind of stairwell here, when you're building stuff in Source, there's a thing called the Arch Tool. And the Arch Tool lets you stagger the different sections of an arch in a really easy way. So here, the level design clearly, I, ar I, I mean, I argue it's clear that they use the Arch Tool to construct this spiral stairwell. And you can see it's made of brushwork. Because otherwise it's too annoying to get all these angles and stuff exactly correct. Let's keep going. Oh man, oof. I kind of love this room too. This room's really nice. This reminds me of like, 
of like, I guess, 70s sci-fi films that use Tokyo as a sci-fi backdrop. Uh, just these really bold, round, impossibly round shapes. Super clean, brutalist concrete, but playful in a way that maybe brutalism wasn't for a long time. I, I feel like this is like a subway station that hasn't been uh, filled up properly. And I think that that's really nice. It does feel like, like the emptiness here feels very purposeful and like serene and like monumental. I like that there's the, these stairs are probably my favorite detail here because they they're, they're kind of hinting at something, some kind of plan that maybe the level designer had at some point and then closed off here. I also really like the uh, choice of texture here. It's a pretty subtle kind of bumpy dirt uh, ground texture thing. And it's really nice because it, it's mostly flat. It reads mostly flat, but you can see the bump map doing its work at, if you look at it from a grazing angle off in the distance. And now we're in here. Oh man, this section. This section, I don't know why. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but there's a part, there's a old source mod uh, from maybe 2005 called Mistake of Pythagoras uh, by a fairly reclusive Japanese modder uh, who's kind of this cult uh, figure in the modding scene who would make really, really great work. But, and he, and he would often make, he would make environments that are kind of like this, where they feel like really like movie sets, like, uh, like if you've seen the movie Brazil, this kind of evokes like a Brazil sense of brutalist bureaucracy here. I like the use of fencing here. I like that there's so much fencing that it's hard to read the shape of fencing and where it's like guiding and hurting us. Oh, and then there's like a secret elevator here. Really clever. Oh, and I can't walk over here. I don't like that there's an invisible wall here. I think that doesn't really fit with the rest of this game's aesthetic where they have where the even if even that glass was like faintly there i think i would have preferred having some kind of railing right here and now we're in the prison and now we're stuck in this prison Oh, now we get out of the prison. Yay. So now all this debug stuff kind of helps you imagine that this is helps uh, you read this as Davy's intervention where Coda would have trapped you in that prison, but now Davy is like hacking the game to let you leave. And that's kind of what he's talking about in the narration right now. Really nice, clean construction here. And oh man, look at this. Look at this vault. Nice vault. Again, now we're back here. Really nice room. Like you see, in, in there's a lot of like real world architectural examples where you have some kind of large structure and then a circular skylight at the top. And when you have that circular skylight and the light filters in and makes that shape on the ground and walls, it just looks really, really nice. 
Um, in New York, there's a, in the Fulton Center, there's the, there's a part of the Fulton Center subway station called the Oculus. And that, this kind of reminds me of the Oculus a little bit. Or at least the original plan for the Oculus. A nice, nice uh, juxtaposition of these round shapes with these chunky square, sh boxy square shapes. That's nice as well. I also really like how these separate wings that we don't actually enter and they're too dark so we can't even really see what's going on, but they're helping to evoke the vastness of the space. Uh, if you've watched me in previous weeks, I've kind of complained about this trend in level design where uh, the idea was that you're supposed to build out a world outside of the actual walkable, accessible area of the video game level to help evoke the idea that there's a larger world outside. And I think most of the time people do that in a very kind of sloppy, perfunctory kind of way where you look out a window and you see like a tree and like a bush or something. And that's just so, that's boring. That's just so sad. That does, that's not a world. Looking at a tree outside the window does not evoke a world to me. Um, there's actually a Simpsons episode. I was watching Simpsons the other day uh, where uh, they're at the retirement home and um, Abraham Simpson's joking about how they're going to go to the staring window. They're going to stare at this tree outside the window, and that's what they do for fun. They just sit there and stare at a tree. I think that's what a lot of video game environment attempts at evoking a world outside often feel like to me. I think what makes this work much better is that it's so much more moodier. It seems so much more purposeful and direct. And it's also mirroring in terms of scope and scale the same walkable area that we just walked down, right? Like this thing is clearly a counterpart to this thing over here in terms of scale and magnitude. So we don't have to walk down here. We don't have any desire to walk down here because we already know what it would be kind of like to walk down here already. That's where symmetry in level design helps a lot. Symmetry kind of helps you relate one part of the level to another part. And then the player can kind of imagine it better. Anyway, sorry to keep talking about these square rooms. Let's keep going. I think this is going to be the longest playthrough of the beginner's guide that anyone has ever done in history. And we're out here. Really smart move here where we're going down underground and then we look up and then we see sky and we don't expect to see the sky. And this is just, oh man, I like this. This is very, very Half-Life 1. Just in terms of like the choices about how rounded to make this shape, the way this fence is constructed, even the relative like low polyness of this displacement terrain right here. Oh man, I can't type today. My wireframe, my wireframe one, one. Oh man, oh god, I can't even see that. Oh, they're denying me the low poly wireframe here. So that's because uh, when you turn on wireframe mode, it actually just swaps out the materials. So if that material, that that wireframe material is missing, then you can't actually see it. But just notice how angular and sharp this kind of looks compared to what you might imagine source engine terrain usually looks like. And that's why I argue this looks like a Half-Life 1 era kind of room. So that's interesting. The idea that this keeps bouncing back and forth between like Half-Life 2 and Half-Life 1 back and forth. It's like Half-Life 1.5. This is also maybe a story about a Half-Life 1 era mapper who can't really let go of the past and can't let go of how level design is changing. This door feels very anachronistic though. 
Notice on the texture on this door, it's very, very, like all the edges are highlighted and beveled and stuff with nice sharp creases like that. That's not something you would normally associate with this kind of level design. This is almost more like an Overwatch kind of thing. <laughs> all right, let's solve this puzzle the same way. Oh man, this lever, I forgot to talk about this lever. This, this like, lever thing is told so Half-Life 1, too. Just having, like, a block embedded in another block. Genius. Oh, what's this room? Oh, this is interesting. Look at this. So, here there's a texture that should not be here. It feels like they forgot to retexture this part. Or the or whoever the implied level designer is forgot to texture that part. So that's kind of interesting. This feels like an in progress, unfinished kind of room, even by the standards of the rest of the levels we've gone through. Then we get weird blocky lighting that doesn't look very good, which we know now to be a very specific choice on the part of whoever made this. It feels kind of like Egyptian or Roman or something. It feels like some kind of ancient monolithic kind of architecture. Walk down here. And now we are in this room and I think I'm actually gonna stop here. Um, oh wait, no, it's not a chapter break. Okay, I'm gonna keep going until a chapter break because apparently you cannot save in this game. There's a little fireplace here giving off a little bit of light. I like that. Ooh, I don't like this. Whoever was making this, uh, you could have like worked with the smoothing groups a little bit nicer on that. I don't know, that doesn't look that good. So now we have to have a kind of conversation with these characters. The fiction, so there's multiple levels of fiction here, right? There's the fiction in world about Coda making this level. Then there's also the fiction of Davy Reedon uh, wrapping another fiction around how the source engine works. And then that's what this is kind of interfacing with where the source engine does not have a conversation system like this. You have to man you have to code something like this, especially to get as much control over text display as they're doing here. Uh, that's actually kind of hard to do without actually coding, doing some custom coding yourself. Um, you there, do you come up from above? What was up there? Yes, there was an enormous prison. Like, look at those text transitions. That's not, that's not built in. That's another lie about the source engine we're being told. Uh, yes, I did. This was literally the last thing I did before coming. I think I'd rather lie. In the spirit of lying to us, I'm going to lie to them too. I go anywhere I please. Well, geez, Debbie Downer here. I can actually jump up there. Oh, there's books on the table, but you can't even see the books because you have to jump up to see them. Uh, I can't read the text. Oh, well. But that's kind of an interesting choice. There's books there that we can't really jump up to see. And then there's a invisible wall preventing me from jumping on the stage. All right, let's uh let's keep going and go this way. Ooh, nice symmetry right here. That's nice. This is actually kind of evoking Stanley Parable a little bit here. <laughs> oh, look at these lights. I wonder if these lights were baked into the texture. I feel like they were. 
Maybe it's using the old natural selection overlay trick. Oh, nice. We're, we're back in the same room. But of course, there's actually just two copies of the room that we walked into. Oh, it's slightly different too. It's less textured. Uh, was there a puzzle you had to pass through? No, I've been right here this entire time. Why would I sit in the black space? I don't know if I want to sit in the black space. I'm already going kind of slow. Um, oh, does Source have a Fulbright console command? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if I remember it, though. In my Half-Life 2 playthrough, I did it. Uh, it's one of these R light commands. I'm totally not remembering what it is, though. Oh, is there a Matt Fulbright? Oh, there is a Matt Fulbright. Nice. Oh. Huh. Yeah, I guess those were a bunch of spotlights then. Oops. Uh, Fulbright. Yes, that is where the studio that made Gone Home gets its name. Fulbright is like the default state of a level. Uh, it's the unlit state of a level. So that's Fulbright. Oh, now we're going down another spiral stairwell. I really like in games where things feel long. I like it when there's like a really long stairwell, really long stairs. You'll recall that scene with the towers. There's really long stairs. You'll recall in uh, Metal Gear Solid 3, there's the ladder that you have to climb that's like five minutes long. I wish games did that more often because you actually really do like feel the time a little bit better than usual when that happens. Oh, and now we're in a courtyard that just feels... Yeah, very heavily sourced and researched, just like that cafe was earlier. Feels like we're in some kind of like housing project, maybe. A really nice little lamp post here. I like this environment. I like how uh, it, it, it evokes night in a pretty nice way. Oh, okay, it's already ending. I wanted to look around more. Oops. Okay, now I think I'm going to stop with this chapter called This Game is Connected to the Internet. Um, so that was about an hour. We're about, I think, maybe a third or halfway through Beginner's Guide. Um, I don't know if I'll play through the rest because I often don't like playing through the whole thing of a short narrative-based game because, I, I don't know, I don't really like doing that to someone. But um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how I'm feeling next week. Well, I'm actually going on a two-week hiatus from now on because uh, next week I'm at, uh, I'll be taking a trip for spring break. And then the week after that, I'll be at GDC. So we're, there's, there's actually going to be a two-week hiatus where you're not going to be getting any new broadcasts or episodes from me, unfortunately. Uh, but hopefully in two weeks, we'll see how I'm feeling. Maybe in two weeks I'll feel like playing it again. Uh, we'll see. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me. Uh, hope that was really interesting for you. And uh, if you liked talking about 
like to when I was talking about the level design details, again, you should just play this game and get the actual experience of walking through it and listening to the narration. Anyway, thanks for tuning in and see you in like two weeks-ish. Um, bye.